Marine commander who spent 26 years on active duty, followed by 16 years in industry, rising to the level of CEO of Spartan Corporation. I'm author of a book, From CEO to CEO, A Practical Guide for Transitioning from Military to Industry Leadership, which provides critical information for both transitioning veterans and for companies that intend to hire veterans. And by far the worst advice I ever got as I was leaving the military was, all your future civilian company needs from you is good leadership. It's not just good. Come on, Bill. I heard that too. That's not true. It's not just good leadership. No, it's not even true in the military, Phil. You know, if it was, we'd be able to take that B-52 wing commander, put him in command of a submarine, and he would do just fine. You actually have to know something about the position you're in. It's just as true in industry as it is in the military. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's so funny, right? They, like, they sugarcoat, they tell us that. And then, and then we write books like this. So first of all, congratulations on a terrific book, a book that I wish I had read when I got out way back a million years ago in 96. But tell, tell me, Bill, if it's not just leadership and it is about the position, why don't we tell people that? Why don't we tell our, our men and women that? You know, unfortunately, I think as people are transitioning from the military, the, the powers that be, the ones who kind of craft the curriculum, the transition assistance program as it was when you and I got out. And uh, it's got new names today, but they want to make the veteran feel really good about the service. And they want to make them feel like their military service will translate directly into their civilian careers. And that's simply not true. And by telling the veteran that, and the great lie, which is all you need is good leadership, um, then you, you, you make them feel good about themselves before they transition, you actually make it harder for them to transition because you fail to tell them the truth, the, the, what their attitude ought to be as they transition and what they need to do to succeed in this new environment. There's a good book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And so and in, what that book says is the more successful you were in your prior life, the greater potential you have to struggle in your future life, because you will believe that all these things, these successes you had, that was all you. And in fact, it happened in a certain set of circumstances, certain operating environment with certain people, certain talent surrounding you. And you know, when you leave the military and you join industry, none of that will be true. So what got you here won't get you there. And military folks need to understand that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I had Marshall on a couple of weeks ago, Marshall Goldsmith, and we talked mm -hmm. about a lot of stuff. And it's so interesting uh, that, you, that you quote that book because, you know, I, I teach that to salespeople, right? I mean, just because right. you're successful at your last place doesn't mean you're going to be successful here. It doesn't mean you're not. Let's be clear here. Right. But you need more humility than hubris to get mm -hmm. through this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's not that military people leave with hubris, but sometimes they leave with an inappropriate air of confidence regarding their future state. And so, you know, I say in the book, doesn't matter if you're a two-star admiral, when you join that company, you're a, an ensign all over again, or second lieutenant all over again, because you do not know what this operating environment is going to be. You don't know what it's going to take to succeed. You don't know how they measure success. You probably think you do, but it's very likely that you're going to be wrong about all those aspects. Yeah, that that's so interesting, right? I mean, you, I, I, I'm to be, uh, you know, to be clear here, industry means like civilian world. Like for those that are not military, that are listening, that are that are hearing this, because I know we're going to have some folks that want to hire military folks, hopefully, that are listening in, right? So when we talk industry, right, we're talking your like community people, civilian people, right? So not not, not military, and and I might argue. Maybe not even DOD, right, Bill? Are we talking, or is DOD separate, or are they the same? No, no, it's true everywhere. It's true in all of civilian employment. All, all these truths that I try to, you know, put into the book are true regardless of what kind of company you go to. It's true whether it's a service industry, like IT services, like you were in, or a product company. It doesn't matter. All these things are true. 
And I do encourage, obviously, civilian companies to employ veterans. But I also tell them, look, if you just throw them in the deep end without a plan for how they're going to be successful, they're going to drown just like anybody else. So you've got to understand what the veterans' strengths and weaknesses are and play to the strengths and help them ameliorate the weaknesses. And so I talk about both in the book, the strengths and weaknesses. They're going to have some wonderful strengths. For example, in the, in the military, we call it driving through the suck. And with that, in the civilian industry, that's, you know, put fire in the belly, that's, you know, being able to, to put up with, you know, hard jobs or hard environments. Military folks can do that all day long, right? And so it's a wonderful starting point in civilian private industry. But on the other hand, the, the veteran may have an inappropriate level of confidence about certain things that they think they'll understand when they transition, but they, they really won't. And the employer has to help them understand what they don't understand. In fact, I encourage employer, employers to stop saying, thank you for your service. Everything you do that separates the veteran employee from the non-veteran employee builds a wall between the veteran employee and the non-veteran employee. That's not going to help the veteran. And so by you know, thanking them for past success or past service, it's a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. I love it when I hear that. But as an employer, thank them when they've done something for you. Not for something, you know, if you want to thank them for past performance one time, that's fine. But then make it very clear to them that, you know, they're, they're in the real world of, of, of employees um, where people actually get fired almost never happens in government, right? Where people actually get fired, it's what you're going to do for the company that's going to matter, not what you've done for the country. And that's a difficult message for people to convey. And it's one that somebody who in civilian industry who has never served will have a very hard time saying to the veteran that they know has. And it doesn't serve the veteran well for that never served boss to hold back in saying, communicating these very important messages to the veteran employee. They've got to communicate clearly and effectively to all their employees, including the, those that have served in, in active duty. Yeah, definitely. It's so, so interesting. I, I get, uh, you know, it, other than my haircut, probably nothing indicates that I was ever in the military and this grows out. So it's interesting because when I talk, I sometimes get fortunate enough to talk to veterans groups and talk to our brothers and sisters in arms. And it's so interesting to me because I'm the only one that talks real to them. I'm the only one that'll say, you know what? I don't like, I don't care what you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? Like, and, and I think that's one of the other challenges, Bill, is sometimes that connection of what they did yesterday, even if there is a connection, they don't know how to make it. Right. Right. They don't know how to, how to talk about that in ways that civilian people understand. So let's, let's talk about that leadership piece, Bill. Let's back that mm -hmm. up just a smidge here. Cause I think that's really important. You're not saying that military people don't have leadership, correct? but you're saying that it's different, right? Different types of leadership. Yeah, it could be different. And in the book, I refer to situational leadership. And we learn all kinds of different leadership techniques in the military, right? But in active duty operational situations, we tend to evolve, devolve to a certain leadership style that may not be appropriate in a civilian company. And I, I tell my active duty friends, leadership is hard, but it's even harder when you're, those that you're leading can actually quit. And, you know, I might have said something that my submarine crew thought was challenging or even crazy, but in the end, there was no place for them to go. They, they weren't leaving that steel tube, right? In the civilian world, your employees can actually quit. And when they start quitting, that's on you. That's not on them. It's because you didn't adapt. And, and unfortunately, again, getting back to the conversations that your employer might not be willing to have with you, it's really hard for a, let's say your, your boss who's never served in the military to tell you knowing that you were you commanded a brigade in the army thousands of soldiers 
telling you your leadership style sucks. And it may be true, right? It may be true in this environment. It wasn't true in the army, but it may be true in this environment. And rather than have that hard conversation with you, where you're going to get all obstinate and, you know, a chip on your shoulder. What the heck do you know about leadership? I've commanded thousands of soldiers, right? They just will avoid the conversation and let you fail. And that's a sad part of this, right? And it does, I've seen it lead to veterans failing in their civilian jobs, which is heartbreaking. Yeah, well, it's it's a failure of leadership at the highest level because if we don't have those crucial conversations where they need to happen, the organization loses because they think, well, veteran leadership is the leadership I want. I want someone who can lead through the suck. I want someone because, you know, sometimes, mm -hmm. many times it sucks. But then they just make the same mistake over and over again and they avoid it. So at the highest level, they have to come in and really, I think, hit that head on and say, to your point, let's have that tough conversation. Hey, Bill, things aren't working as well as we'd like them to. Here might be why. Let's try this. Here's a, well, here's a and different that, way, right? It actually leads to... Another point that the CEO or somebody senior in the company who wasn't a served veteran will say, you know what, we hired that veteran into that leadership role. It really didn't work out. So let's not do that again. Let's take somebody from another company, from industry, rather than a veteran. Uh, and because, you know, we, for whatever reason, it soured our experience, our opinion on putting veterans into leadership roles, which is actually why I wrote, wrote the book. The subtitle of the book is A Practical Guide for Transitioning from Military to Industry Leadership. I looked for another book that talked about that, that had a point of view of a hiring manager, which I was, not a recruiter or not a transition flag officer who was handed his leadership position because he was a flag officer, but somebody who worked their way up in industry. And I couldn't find that book. And so I decided I had to write it, which I never really wanted to do. The point is that if somebody fails, and this is unfair, but it's real life. If a veteran fails in a particular job, the people who never served will say, well, you know what? This isn't, veterans can't serve in that role anymore because they just don't have the skills. The military doesn't teach them what they need to do. No, rather than saying that person didn't adapt, that person could have done well, but either we didn't tell him how to do well, or he wasn't self-aware enough to figure out what he needed to change. It wasn't the fact that he was in the military. It was specific to that human being. And it, it ruins things for every veteran, which is very sad. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Very. Yeah. Heartbreaking, man. Heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. So, so, so with that, Bill, let's, Let's talk a little bit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your your military career, and then we'll jump back to leadership here. Because so I think it's interesting. You're the first submariner that I've had on the show, mm -hmm. so that's kind of fun, right? I mean, I've talked to uh, Navy SEALs, I've talked to techs, I've talked to other folks. So, so what was the weirdest thing about being a submariner in in the Navy? Oh, geez, you're talking about submariners. They would tell you there's a lot weird going on in a submarine. Not, not not the kind of weird that we can't talk about. It's just it takes a certain kind of human being to agree to submerge their ship. And, you know, and I tell my I have astronaut classmates who I say, look, when you go up in space, that's one atmosphere, delta pressure. We see one atmosphere, delta pressure every 33 feet that we're submerged. Right. So if you're so you're seeing multiple atmospheres and we're in a corrosive environment, which space isn't. And you're isolated. You can't communicate. You know, in my day, you couldn't communicate at all. You got incoming, um, what we call familygrams, where the families had something like 50 words a month they were allowed to send you. But we wow. couldn't transmit out. Nobody knew whether you were alive or dead until months later when you surfaced in a place you could transmit, right? And, and so there's a lot that's kind of unusual about being in a submarine. But I, the thing I... I really liked about being a submarine commander was it was like it was like the old Navy or old sailing ship days is since you couldn't transmit and nobody really knew who you were, you were on your own as an 05, the commander rank in the Navy, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, Army, Air Force, that equivalent. There's no surface ship CEO is on his own. He's communicating and being told what to do constantly or she. 
submarine commanders are, were, and pretty much still are, the last vestige of that independent commanding officer who has to make the right decision because nobody's there to get advice from. And that was kind of the really cool thing about being a submarine commander. That is cool. That is cool. And that's in, in some ways, that's almost like running a, a brand new startup where you've never, you know, you have no peers yet. You have mm -hmm. nobody yet to bounce any ideas off of. So that's that's super interesting. And yeah, I, I, I forgot, right, that we have not that, that we've changed and that it is yeah, that there probably is some communication. So so with that, I mean, how do you relate that to civilian folks, Bill, who've never been on a ship or never been in a sub, never served? I mean, how, how do they kind of wrap their arms around that and understand that really, I mean, that's that's a different type of leadership. It is, yeah. And I'm not sure they ever do um, wrap their arms around it or understand it. But what they do understand is, you know, is this person smart enough, adaptable enough to you know, kind of transition their their life, their way of thinking, their mental framework into this environment and that's going to, to move the company forward. And I think that, you know, I, I was very lucky in that I joined a company that was willing to invest in me and put me in a stretch assignment, a leadership stress, stretch assignment. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I succeeded and, you know, hit the ball out of the park from the beginning. I didn't. Happily, I had a, a boss or a mentor who was willing to grab me by the shirt collar and say, dude, I've, I've risked my career on you. I put a lot of faith in you and you're screwing it up. You know, that was a wake up call for me. And, and so I said, my goodness, I better listen to this guy because I think this is one step short of getting fired. Okay, tell the wife, I'm going on deployment again. It's a different kind of deployment in that I'll be home every night, but I'm going to be working like crazy because I got to fix this. I'm, and I'm not exactly sure what this is yet, but I've got to fix whatever it is. I got to figure out what it is and fix it, or I may be looking for another job. And happily, I did fix it and things worked out really well for me in my civilian career. But again, it wasn't the situation where I came in with, with an epiphany, knowing exactly what I needed to do. It wasn't that. Another reason I wrote the book is to help people avoid that situation that I found myself in. Wow. Wow. So so with that, right, part, part of that transition is you just mentioned your spouse, right, your wife. Mill spouse is a tough role, too. So how is this um, is, is the book? Is it helpful for military spouses too, Bill, or is it primarily for the, the leader? No, I do think and I've had a couple of spouses read it already and said, you know, hey, I know how to, I know, and this is going to sound probably not very uh, pub, uh, politically correct, but I'm going to say it the way it was said to me. Now I see, now I've read this thing, I know what to badger my spouse over, right? Um, I know what they need to do, and I know where to pressure them to get them to do it. And so I think it's helpful in that regard. Now, I don't endorse badgering. Um, <laughs> however, Knowing what where you need to go, for example, I talk about when to make the transition into civilian life, right? What point in your career and the pros and cons of transitioning after only a few years versus transitioning when you're retirement age from the military, 20 years. Um, you could, if you transition in 20 years, you can still put another 20 years in your second career in industry. And um, you may need that 20 years to gain, you know, kind of like the nest egg you need to retire comfortably. Uh, on the other hand, if you start an industry early, you have a longer period of time to attain that position you, you seek. But um, you may, in both cases, you may be starting out, you know, kind of in an entry level position. And so you need to understand what that means and what it means for you at different points in your career. So I talk about all those things in the book and spouses can benefit from that knowledge. <laughs> excellent, 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 good stuff. So, so, so Bill, we're, we're, we're getting close here to wrapping up mm -hmm. here and there's so much, so much goodness that's in the book that's available for folks. How do they, how, 
obviously they need to buy the book, right? But if if there's another way, if they want to get started, just thinking about it, let's 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 get them in the right mindset here. Maybe an action they can take or something that they can think about. Let's uh, like how far out should they start thinking, and then what's one or two things that they can do to get started? Yeah, you need to start planning for your transition at least two years before you you make the transition um, because you need to study you need to read the book read other books i encourage people to read other books um, but you know my i've read the other books and i still and i spent two years writing mine if that tells you anything right so um so, so that's point number one and what they re what i really encourage people to do is a lot of folks are going to give them advice folks that are being paid to give them advice will give them advice folks that are trying to be helpful, give them advice. And my point is only take advice from people who have succeeded getting where you want to be. Don't take advice from people who've made the transition but are still struggling or, you know, because you, there will be plenty of advice out there and most of it worth exactly what you paid for it. And so make sure you, you pay a lot of attention to who you're getting that advice from rather than what the advice is. Wow. I love that, Bill. That's great, man. I, two years to transition. That's a long time, but it's a short time because you're working full time. I mean, if you're in the military, you're active duty. Over two years, maybe you'll get a couple of weeks to yourself to think. So I think exactly. that's that's super important. And I love that advice, right? Take advice from people who've succeeded with where you want to be, folks on that. So, so cool, man. So great stuff, Bill. I super appreciate it. Friends, the book is fantastic. It's from CO to CEO. You can go to williamtody.com. Last name is spelled T-O-T-I. Dot com And Bill, if you had a favorite social network, if people are going to come talk to you or have questions or ask for some feedback, where would you want them to go? LinkedIn is best for career advice. Um, and by the way, if you are transitioning your LinkedIn person, don't make somebody have to go through 40 questions to connect with you. You're, you're shielding yourself from people who are trying to help. So that's a, an immediate bit of advice because I'm noticing more and more people just kind of make it really hard to connect with them. And yet they're looking for a job. That's the kind of thing that an employer is going to say, they must not really want that job. So forget that person's immediate off the, off the list, you know? And so make it easy to, for people to yeah. connect with you. Yeah. And I would also add to that. I would say, make it obvious that right. you're a service member, right? Don't hide that. Do show that. In fact, I might even add that to my headline. If I'm transitioning, transitioning because it makes a military yes. officer. Exactly. That's right. right. Yeah. 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 Yep, mm -hmm. make it really easy, really obvious what you're doing there because you can get by then without a message, but I would still say it's still good to send a message, still good to be personal. And yeah, make it easy for people who want to connect with you. Mm -hmm. Bill, that's great advice, man. Any last final words here as we wrap up from CO to CEO? You should be proud of your military service. It's going to help you accelerate your civilian career but only if you have the right attitude when you make the transition. Awesome. Awesome. Think about your mind, friends. Right. Get your mind right. Be humble and yet proud. Make yep. it happen and get yourself a copy of From CEO to CEO. Thanks so much, Bill. Really.